Thank you very much. Uh, so today, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, ChatGPT um, and how that fits in with the uh, Wolfram worldview. Uh, we are live, so please do ask questions as we go. I'm sorry we're having some technical problems with cameras, so we'll just have to imagine me speaking. Um, but what today's talk is, uh, is fundamentally uh, about uh, the differences between statistical AI and uh, symbolic AI. First of all, let me try and define the difference between statistical AI and uh, symbolic AI. Um, the large language models, ChatGPT and uh, BARD and, uh, and the whole collection of these things that are uh, appearing at the moment, are in this space of statistical uh, AI in that um, while they have this sort of appearance of intelligence, fundamentally they're doing one very simple thing, which is predicting the next word that follows some previous words. And so it's an entirely kind of probabilistic guessing exercise. But it turns out, uh, and as we've discovered in, in the last year, as these things have emerged on, into the mainstream, uh, that prediction can be incredibly good. And it's so good at using both kind of short range and long range uh, context to use that, to find that next predicted word and the word that follows that, that the words that it can predict often form the answer to a question or the, if the words uh, that precede it are an explanation, uh, a statement, the words that follow could be an explanation. Or if the words that precede are some instructions, it seems capable of following instructions. And this is where it starts, you get this emergent behavior that appears to be intelligence. But it's worth remembering that in the end, it's guessing words using probabilities, because that does affect what it really can deep down do and what it can't. Now, Wolfram um, for 35 years, and um, me personally at Wolfram for 32 of those, have been very much concerned uh, with symbolic AI. And I define that uh, as um, having defined rules of behavior for structured inputs. So uh, structured inputs might be something simple like 2 plus 2, uh, where we have a, an expression and the rules of behavior in that case are addition. And uh, there's no guesswork. We know exactly what the rules are for 2 plus 2 that that should equal 4. And those rules scale up to all kinds of arithmetic. But they can also be more complex uh, structured behavior, uh, structured inputs like an image. And the rules behavior might be finding the edges uh, of, uh, of the contents of an image, or they might be blurring an image. So these defined rules behavior tend to be quite deterministic. Um, and very, uh, you know, very, it's very easy to describe if you understand uh, details exactly what they're going to do. They, they're quite predictable. Now, of course, in our world, statistical AI, uh, and it you know, used to be called AI when I started, really has um, come to be thought of much more as computation. And so these collections of deterministic defined rules of behavior cover all kinds of different areas, like um, things that are more modern, like machine learning, things that are a little bit older, like classical statistics. Structured inputs can be things like geographic information or graphs and networks and social networks. Um, we can do operations on time series. Um, some of the operations might be things like finding the optimal values of things. The data types are quite varied between audio and video and text analysis. And there's all kinds of very specialized domains of computation in the scope of science and engineering and kind of systematic modeling. So it's a very big area that's taken out. Um, some of it hundreds of years to build up, but certainly uh, a, a lot of it's taken at least 50 years to build this collection of computation. So here's the interesting thing when you put those two worlds together, when you consider uh, the pros and cons of statistical versus um, probabilistic uh, versus symbolic AI, is that their strengths and weaknesses are almost the complete opposite. And this table really kind of sums up where I'm going to go in the next few minutes of this uh, presentation that the computational world, the, the, the maths and algorithms world, that's really great at things that are uh, logical, that follow complex rules. It's proven very powerful in uh, data science, and it's very deterministic. If it works once, it'll almost certainly work again the next time. The large language model, the statistical AI, is actually pretty poor at some of those things, and I'll show some examples in a minute. But where its strengths lies are being very flexible and being able to handle a wide range of inputs that might be unpredictable uh, at. And the thing that's wowed everyone, of course, is that it's uh, brilliant at being human-like in its interaction, and it can handle uh, uh, poorly defined fields and unstructured information 
uh, much better than than kind of rule based approaches. So let's let's look at some examples to see what I mean here. If we look first of all at the weaknesses of the large language models. Uh, I said that it was weak at computational thinking. Uh, well, here's a kind of logic problem um, that I've put into ChatGPT. Uh, all of my examples here, I think, are pretty much ChatGPT 3.5, but these are fundamental issues. So while GPT 4 is substantially better than 3.5, fundamentally, um, it has the same weaknesses, just uh, hidden slightly better. So in this word problem, I'm providing some information. If Alice is older than Bob, Bob was older than Charlie, Charlie's younger than Derek, and then I'm asking a question, is Alice older than Derek? Now, the the large language model writes a very nice essay here and describes how the relationship can be uh, thought of as a chain and how it joins up and answers the question, yes, Alice is older than, uh, uh, that, then it follows that Alice is older than Derek. Actually, it's wrong because it's got muddled in the logic, just like humans do if you don't think about it deeply. And in a computational world, we can call that a quantifier elimination problem. And we can show that uh, it's not true to claim that for all possible Alice's and Derek's in that setup, Alice is uh, greater than Derek. And in fact, if I reverse that, it's also not true to say the opposite. So it's an indeterminate problem. There is insufficient information here to decide uh, who is going to be taller out of Alice and Derek. But the 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 large language model, for all its ability to um, fluently answer my question, has got muddled in that logic because it's already too complicated for it to work through. Now, that gets much worse when you get into algorithmic um, processes where you want it to follow a sequence of steps uh, in the way that uh, programming algorithms in a programming language are very straightforward to do. And that even goes as far as uh, something completely basic, which is uh, arithmetic that I've asked it here this uh, this problem. And if you chat to uh, ChatGPT or their ilk, then ask it three or four digit problems, it pretty much uh, gets the right answer. Uh, but when things get slightly more complicated beyond things that it's seen, and it actually has to start applying the rules, we can see that, uh, that the answer we've got here is actually um, uh, different from the answer that it stated. It's actually very close. It's uh, it's kind of pattern recognition has thrown all of the kind of right characters down, except that it's uh, it's it's about 0.1% out because this digit here is different than the one that uh, it imagined. And that's because it doesn't actually fundamentally understand arithmetic. Um, it uh, it um, It's really using recall to see problems that it's seen before. And in fact, let's go to ChatGPT for a moment and do something you know, only slightly more complicated. Let's do uh, three to the power 30 and ask uh, um, ChatGPT to give me an answer. And now we're into sort of much less typical um, uh, computations. And it looks like I'm not going to get any CPU time. Okay, uh, three to the power 30 is, let's see how it does on this, 205891. So let's compare that to the true answer. I wonder if I, I'd say she seems to have done a decent job here. Is it correct all the way through? So in fact, actually, on this occasion, it's got the right answer, but it's not something that can be relied upon uh, uh, when things get uh, you know, at, at all messy. Now, of course, when things get at all complicated, this breaks down completely. So here is its answer uh, to uh, a, a symbolic integration problem. And I liken this to an old um, comedy act in the UK where somebody's playing a terrible piece of music and he's accused of playing all the wrong notes. And he jokes, no, I'm playing all the right notes, just not necessarily in the right order, which really, I think, sums up the uh, answer that it gives here compared to the true answer that we get out of Wolfram Alpha, that all of the bits in his answer look plausible. It's got signs and it's got causes. It's got a quarter in here that uh, seems relevant, but this is fundamentally a different expression. Um, and uh, uh, and you know, is, is just the wrong answer. But it looks plausible because it's all the right kind of words in the answer. And that really sums up the way large language models work is they're focused on plausibility. Another thing that uh, is a little surprising is that they are, um, they are no good with big data, which seems odd when we know that they've been trained on masses of, of data and the models are extremely complicated and have millions or billions of parameters that have been fine tuned to, to create these models. But actually, their attention span, uh, the amount of information they can hold in a in a in a problem that they're now considering, is quite short. In GPT 3.5, it's something like 2,000 tokens. In um, four, it's uh, something in the range of 20 or 30,000 tokens. There are models that aren't quite so proficient that are 
that are doing 100,000 tokens, but that's still tiny when we're talking about data science. So here I've, uh, I've been slightly mean to 3.5 and I've contrived this question that I said, here's a list of numbers. And um, it's actually, in the, when I typed this into GPT, it was um, more than a page of inputs I've omitted so I can fit it on screen here for the presentation, 2,000 items. So I've deliberately chosen a list that's just a bit too long for its memory span. Um, and on the occasion I ran this, it says the answer the question appears to have been truncated. So it's forgotten um, uh, the beginning of the question by the time it got to the end. In fact, now they seem to have made some change when I ran this as a, in a rehearsal for something else last night. Uh, it now deals with the truncation by somehow compressing the question. So it produces now a wrong answer and it just seems to pick a random number out of the list. Um, and it, it can't sim fundamentally deal with these large amounts of, of information because it can't hold it all in, in its kind of working memory. Just like you as a human, if I said, read this list, and then afterwards said, what's the 40th item in it? You probably wouldn't be able to recall that. Um, but you ha might have a working memory of 10 items, and I say, what's the third one? You probably could recall. The LLMs have the same kind of problem. Of course, in a computational world, I can make a random 10 million uh, length vector and ask what's the last element of that same kind of question, but many times larger and it's utterly trivial in a in a uh, symbolic area world. But the one I think that most people uh, that people find um, most um, uh, uh, you know, worrying is the reliability. And here's the uh, example I like to show that I've pre-captured on, on this occasion here where I've asked ChatGPT provide the data on livestock populations in Turkey. Um, and it's given me a very fluent answer. And it's given me some numbers. And I've highlighted one of them. It says that there were 33.4 million sheep in Turkey in 2020. Um, but I've also highlighted something else here that I consider actually more dangerous than the fact that the answer is wrong here, is that it's trying to convince me of the answer by making it as plausible as possible by citing sources. It's been known to make up citations completely. On this occasion, this citation is a real thing. And in fact, a well-chosen relevant citation. So I uh, I went off and went to uh, the Turkstat website and I spent a while going through Turkstat and found the relevant page that answers this question. And you can see that the answer is different. A similar order of magnitude, 40 million instead of 33 million. But it's just imagine the numbers and then try to convince me that it's right by uh, wrapping it in in things like citations. So whenever there is, there is knowledge coming out of the LLM or something that requires computing by, by non-trivial reasoning, you can't trust the values that, get and that, that you get back or the facts that you get back. And that makes it extremely dangerous. Now, I've started by um, being somewhat negative about large language models. They are actually incredibly amazing and a great step forward in uh, in in our technical capacity to, to deal with knowledge. So let's talk a few minutes now about what they're good at, which computation has always struggled with. One thing is, uh, is this sort of flexibility. So we've had Wolfram Alpha for a decade or so, uh, and it takes natural language queries and it answers questions from them. But the way that we've done that is using technologies called context-free grammar, where we're having to pattern match the sentences using rules built by humans. Now, for fairly simple, straightforward queries on things that we know about, it does a pretty good job. But asking the question like, what national land has a total humanoid population in excess of a billion has just too many distracting words for our parser to be able to handle. That you've got a map, uh, humanoid, you've got uh, deal with words like excess, is that a, is that a synonym for greater than uh, a national land, uh, that's a country. So there's all kinds of things I've thrown in to confuse things and we would um, simply choke on that and you would have to learn to ask the question in a better way. Um, the LLM is very good at taking that and rephrasing that into, into a short form, simpler version that in fact uh, is a question that we could answer with Wolf Mouse. For. So this ability to catch the messiness of human language and extract the essence is a really powerful capability that uh, is suddenly going to make Wolf from Alpha much, uh, much easier to use when we, get that prop when we get that properly plumbed in. Um, and somebody was pointing out here, did I, did I really make that mistake? Um, uh, I did have um, the Wolfram plugin enabled, which is possibly why this got the right answer. I think it wasn't actually 
Uh, thanks, Sasmus, for pointing that out. But I think, in fact, in this case, you actually got it right. The previous time I tried it, it got was hopeless. But um, normally, you would see used Wolfram plugin if it had if it had used that. So, um, um, so I think in this occasion, I can't claim that uh, I just messed up the example. It did just get the thing right. Um, now, you've probably seen loads of examples here, but for those who uh, who the concept is new here, let's point out the um, the level of human-like interaction that you can get, that it can, um, in simple prompts, answer uh, questions and write in particular styles. So I can ask it something like describe Wolf Mouth in a language suitable for a seven-year-old, and it already knows lots about the real world, so it doesn't need telling any more that what Wolf Mouth is. It knows about that, and it knows how to speak to a seven-year-old, and so we get this very simply worded explanation of what it is. Um, I, you can use it for um, rewriting and extrapolating on. So uh, here I've got a very long essay, something that uh, probably I wrote on some previous occasion, and I've said summarize that in 50 words, and it can take that and extract the essence and hit the target word count uh, and capture meaning. It can go the opposite direction, so you can use it for very prompted argument making. I've given it the simple argument that messy data is difficult for insights and computable data can be used better. And I said, like, write a 100-word paragraph that uh, that says that elegantly. And we've got text synthesized around an argument that I fed it. Um, it can do things like write poetry. It can write song lyrics. It can... Uh, um, uh, it can suggest uh, um, titles for things. It can come up with plots for um, for a film and then write the screenplay for it with um, with dialogue. All of these things are uh, really quite impressive uh, in in really being able to pass the Turing test now for the first time. Of that, you're not quite sure if you didn't know whether you're talking to a human or to a computer. Um, Something they do a reasonable job at is uh, things where we don't really know what it is that we want or how to do it. Uh, it has re makes a reasonable job, and I've picked an extreme example here of something where probably no one really knows how you should train a dog to sing. But uh, computation has nothing to say about this. If I was given this as a as a consulting project, I would envisage a pretty big budget and lots of uh, sample data for dogs' vocalizations and maybe a physics model or who knows what how I might go about that programmatically and and logically, um, the LLM just has a stab at coming up with an idea. And um, and things that are in the middle where you kind of know what you want, you can know how to say what you want, but you don't know how to describe the rules for getting there, it does quite a decent job at. And I'll show examples of that in a minute. Now, this one, I've got a very simple example, and, uh, and it seems very unprofound, but actually, I'll revisit this in a, in a few minutes. I think it's actually one of the the most misunderstood powers of large language models is a, just a general ability to deal with structured and unstructured data equivalently, to restructure, uh, to extract uh, facts out of poorly structured information, to fix structure. It really understands structure. And so in this example, I've given it a, a, a deliberately non-trivial sentence uh, that I want to extract a single fact from. And I, uh, I'm saying, how many dogs are mentioned in the following text return only the final number? So I'm giving it some instructions of what I want to achieve. And the sentence is, two basset hounds are walking down the street when they saw a Persian cat talking to a Labrador. So in order to get that number three, it's had to uh, process this sentence at the level of understanding that basset hounds are dogs, Labradors are dogs, but a Persian cat isn't a dog. And that the word two is associated with uh, the basset hounds and that there is only a single Labrador mentioned. And so it can do a kind of two plus one and extract the number three. And that is an incredibly powerful capability, um, albeit in a, a trivial example. So that's the background that we're, we're coming from. Um, what we want to do, our sort of outlook on, on AI at the moment and where we're putting all of our efforts, is to try and take that best of both worlds. If I go back to my table here, we want to have a combination of computation and uh, large language model that ticks all of the boxes. And what we've been thinking about and working on are the mechanisms to try and bring those two worlds together to make something that uh, is the best of both. And um, uh, if you've seen our public face on this, uh, there's the Wolfram plugin to chat GPT, which uh, if we go back to uh, GPT here, um, and do the query that I did earlier. Let's just make this window a little bit bigger. 
so I had uh, tell me about livestock populations in Turkey. And uh, hopefully, we, if this does the right thing, what we're going to see is that it's going to, um, because I've got the plugin enabled at the top, the Waltham plugin, along with another one, which I'll show in a moment, it's recognized that we might have something useful to say about this. And, uh, oh, well, that's, uh, let's do a regenerate that. We, we actually, let me do a new chat here and uh, try that again. I think maybe the chat timed out in some way. Um, in Turkey. At least I can say on that occasion, we did the right thing and it was the LLM that did the wrong thing, but let's see if it does the, the right thing if I just start afresh here. Um, so hopefully again, it will recognize that this is a thing that we might know something about that could be useful. And um, it seems like ChatGPT is being a little bit slow today. Okay, it's using Wolfram, so it's giving us a call and saying it's going to rephrase the question here into something we can pass. Actually, we probably could largely cover this sentence already. And now it's got an answer because behind the scenes, it's had this conversation where it's used an English to English conversation to talk to Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha has provided factual information and then it has uh, used that factual information in order to uh, answer the question and uh, write its fluent narrative. So because it got the data from us, it's been freed from this hallucination problem and it's got the correct number now, the 42.1 million uh, sheep and all of the other numbers are correct because they came from a factual source. Um, and it was using its large language model intelligence to decide that we could uh, help with that and how to ask us. So just like, um, you know, I often liken the the large language model to being that sort of super confident loudmouth guy you meet in the pub who thinks he's an expert on everything and has an answer for everything. Um, while that person might spout nonsense at you to look clever, if you've got somebody next to them whispering facts in their ear, they tend to use those because they, they know that using reliable information makes them look better than ignoring it, but uh, they only make stuff up when they don't know. So the facts fixes the reliability on that, that question. So that's the basic idea. It's reliability from computation together with the fluency of large language model. But when you start thinking it through, there's uh, a few different permutations for how that works. So that is, um, just to give a sense of how I'm breaking this down, here I was using the ChatGPT interface. So I've got a particular interface choice. And in this case, the large language model was in charge. I'm talking to the LLM. It was the LLM's decision to give us a call and say, uh, do you know the answer to this? And uh, we can give it multiple points to, to contact for different kinds of information, but it, it's in charge of whether or not to use those. Uh, so one problem is that it may choose not to. It may, uh, uh, if it doesn't think that the endpoint can help, it might go ahead and hallucinate anyway. Um, so you have to try and manage that to make sure that you really convince it that it should, the kinds of things that it should use the reliable endpoint for. Another way around is to put the computational, the symbolic uh, world in charge and make the large language model subservient to that in order to provide LLM kinds of things that it can do. So here's an example doing that the, way, the other way around. I'm in Wolfram language now and I'm, um, I've um, got this wrapper in our language that is our way of abstracting away the large language model behind the scenes. Um, at the moment, we only support Jat GPT 3.5, 3.5 Turbo, and, and GPT 4. But hopefully, over the coming year, this LLM function, it'll be an option to say use Bard or use Falcon or uh, all of these other LLMs that are emerging at the moment. And so the idea is this is an abstraction that says you will execute the following as if it was a function, but it'll be executed on a large language model. And here, my function is not described in terms of programming code is described in terms of words. So my my finance story function is write a blah summary of blah share price yesterday given the following facts, blah. And that's now, uh, and maybe we should try and do this live. Um, uh, I run this right now. Uh, what it will do is uh, randomly choose a style. Well, if I was doing this as a proper piece of computational journalism, I would compute that based on some forward projection. But here I've just randomly picked a style. 
I fetched some factual data out of our financial data feeds. So this is the Microsoft open high, high, low, open high, low close volume data. And I've labeled that in a way that makes it easy for the LLM to understand which bit of information relates to which. And I fed that into the slots of this LLM function. So the function there gets um, the, the script right and exciting, whatever it is, story about Microsoft's share price yesterday, given the following data. And here's the essay that it's come up with. So now there's almost no chance that the LLM won't use the numbers because I injected them right at the start. It didn't have to make any decisions about fetching the numbers. I just said, I want the following text with the following numbers in it. And it, I've so far never seen it fail to use information when you inject it in. It sometimes uh, chooses not to, if you give lots of information, it doesn't use every piece of it and it decides, you know, it might be plausible, it'll say, well, it opened on this price and closed on this and doesn't bother to mention the rest. But I've never seen it hallucinate when you push factual information into the, the prompt itself. So here's the essay that's written. Uh, and I guess looking at the writing here that uh, um, it's, uh, it's chosen to be a pessimistic story. So we've got chat in charge, we've got computation in charge. There's sort of two uh, ways round of, uh, of control. But we also, um, uh, want to think about what is the what is that reliability that we're injecting? You know, I've in the in the uh, plugin that we have publicly. Let's go back to that chat conversation that we had. Oops. Um, um, where is it? Is that one? No, it's not. Where is that one? There. Um, there's two modes for our very generic plugin. It's trying to just do any as general stuff as it can. So one mode is that it asks Wolfmail for a question. And the other mode is, uh, let's say, something like bar chart that. It's a bar chart that, hopefully, it will recognize the other mode of the plugin, which is to synthesize Wolfram language code. Uh, OK, uh, it has not done the right thing, so it's failed to use the endpoint and said, I had no idea how to do that. Uh, so let's give it a little bit more assistance and say, use the plugin. Um, and hopefully, this time, it will do something more sensible using Wolfram again. And if we look behind the scenes, what it's doing this time, yep, it's doing the right thing this time, is it's synthesizing Wolfram language code. In this case, the command that you would have to type in order to generate uh, a bar chart. So a pretty trivial bit of code, but it's uh, it's gone a bit further and it's adding some styling information and some uh, some plot labels maybe, yes. Uh, and what it's got back from us executing that code. So we've taken that live synthesized code and executed it in a sandbox. Um, uh, in order to generate a picture, and then we fed the picture URL back to the LLM, which has then embedded it into the um, into the answer. So you have to sandbox that because and this idea of being on synthesized code is potentially dangerous because it might get confused that the right code for a bar chart is to do uh, file delete star dot star recursive and uh, just try and destroy the machine at the far end. So we have to run that in a safe environment, but. Um, the idea here is that you now have very open-ended kinds of things that you could do um, that if you can describe it uh, within code. So those are both very general. They're open-ended. Wolf Alpha can do lots of things. Wolf Language can do lots of things in an, only a few lines of code. Um, but what we also want to do is to encode our own knowledge or our own data into, um, into the system. So Here's one way we do that. This is using the chat uh, GPT still as an interface. This is a kind of just a workflow utility we built called chat plugin cloud deploy. And the idea is this is uh, creates the pipeline of creating custom endpoints for the chat GPT interface. And it takes a, a few fairly straightforward arguments. The tool has a name, in this case, UK income tax calculator. It's got one or more endpoints, which are the actual places it can call for help. Um, one of the endpoints, in fact, the only one in this tool is called tax due. And then it has a Wolfram language program that will execute on that API. So it's an API that takes an income and uh, at, expects it to be an integer. That's probably not really the right way to write it. It probably should just say number here because you might have uh, something 0.50 on your income. And then in this case, it does arithmetic. Uh, I picked this example. I was talking to some tax people. It's uh, quite a nice example that uh, 
sort of underlines the problem with LLMs is that the um, the chat GPT knows the main basic tax rules for UK income tax. But a few prime ministers ago, or um, a rule was introduced to increase the top rate of tax without looking like it was increasing the top rate of tax. And the way that uh, the that government did it was they took the tax-free allowance, the bit you earn before you start paying tax, and made it go down as your earning went up. So for every pound above £100,000 in the UK, uh, every two pounds rather, you lose one pound of your tax-free allowance. So in fact, you're paying 60% tax, not 40, because uh, you're paying it on more money than you realise. That was designed to deliberately to kind of mislead the, the, the public so that it you didn't have to confront the idea of having a 60 pence top rate tax and uh, mislead the newspapers a little bit. But it also in inadvertently misleads the large language model. So you ask this question, it says top rate in the UK is 40%. 40% after the tax-free allowance is this. Here's your long answer. So I've created this little bit of arithmetic that computes the personal allowance, how that diminishes and subtracts that. And, and you know, it's only arithmetic, but it's already too complex for the LLM. And now if we go back to, I've got my um, plugin enabled at the top, having deployed it, I can then say in here, um, uh, what is the uh, uh, tax I would, pay, would, would pay in the UK on an income of, and let's make sure we're in that bound, 112,000 pounds. And hopefully what it will do here is um, recognize my custom tool that I, you know, that. I created that is at the moment personal to my account. It's used it so I can look behind the scenes here and see the conversation that's happened. And you can see here that it's figured out which is the parameter to pull out of my conversation. And it's got the computed value back. The um, text writing is being very slow, but uh, uh, I'm sure it will use those numbers within its essay. So there's a couple of things to observe here. One is this is private knowledge. You know, and okay, this particular thing is a well-known bit of knowledge, but this could be any algorithm. This could be my secret algorithm for, for making some decision about whether I should buy a share or not. And that can be computed on my server uh, behind an endpoint that hides how it's done. All the uh, interface saw was the, the request and the answer. Um, and this was doing arithmetic, but once we're in the code world, the world of sort of computational code, this could do anything. So this could uh, um, access my private databases. It could access um, it could access something actually in the physical world. It could drive a robot or it uh, could read some, uh, some telemetry from something. Once we're in that computational world, everything that we've taken for granted for years suddenly becomes available to the large language model as well, mediated by you deciding what the tool is capable and not capable of doing. I said it might be a very bad idea if you have um, if if you allow arbitrary access through such an API. So if your robot could be controlled to do anything, then some uh, some poorly imagined piece of large language model control or some malicious user could make it do something bad. Um, so we want these things typically to lock down what it can do in within with some safety. Another thing to observe is here that. Um, uh, while it's, this is more powerful with what's called prompt engineering, where I could give text that describes when to use the tool, when not to use the tool, what it does, how to interpret the results. In its minimal form, I haven't had to do any of that because already it's managed to infer from the name of the tool and the name of the endpoint and the name of the parameter. The LLM is already intelligent enough to have figured out the context in which you can use it, uh, which is how it figured out, if we go back to this and we can see the answer we have now, that um, that uh, when I asked it this question, it knew enough to know that that made the tool appropriate and and that it had to pull out the income part of that, not necessarily the UK part of that sentence to pass as a parameter. So there's a lot of kind of inference going on, but it also reminds you of those sort of uh, first lessons in programming where your computer science teacher said, always name your function sensibly. Um, that used to be for human benefit, but actually here it really does matter. It affects the performance of this tool if I give this tool a sensible name because it actually is being used in the same way as the human programmers like to be able to read the function names to know when to use the right one. So does the LLM. So it becomes a, a more important part of your practice. Now, so that was um, custom knowledge in a chat GPT interface. But if we want to build our own interfaces, um, to embed something in our application or um, to, because we have some uh,
custom way that uh, that we want to access it from maybe not even from a human but from a uh, from a database or something then we also need to have a code interface to the same kind of concept and here's how we've been extended the extending the wolf language to achieve that um, uh, so the uh, here I'm calling, again, one of these abstractions on LLMs, which is LLM synthesized, and that is just write an essay. And I'm giving it the essay I want to write, but this would, I guess, come out of your user interface if you were making a tool uh, for people to chat to. Uh, but I'm declaring the tools that are available. So this is the equivalent of that deployed plugin that I had in the um, in ChatGPT. I'm saying uh, in the tools list, in this case, there is one tool, and it's called City Population Finder. And I've given a little bit of prompt engineering this time to say what it's for. It's to get the populations of cities, I've got a parameter um, which says it's going to be called city, but it actually has to be a city. Um, and then I'm going to call the wolf, uh, the wolf from knowledge base to just fetch the property entity value of the population of the city. So when we get the answer back, all of the text here down to here was pure large language model, the LLM in charge. Um, but at that point, it's decided that it needs access to the information from the tool. And so it's called the tool. Uh, with the appropriate parameter of, uh, what is it? This is writing about um, uh, Chicago. And it's got back the hour number for the population of Chicago. And then it's continued with its essay in the LLM world until it got to here. And it's called the tool again and said, uh, can you give me uh, the um, population of New York? And then it's used that number and it's written the rest of it in the LLM world. So it's exactly the same thing as plugins, but this is under programmatic control. And again, once you're in that code world, you can do all kinds of things. So here, for example, same kind of idea, but I'm just using a different context. I'm using this uh, uh, LLM tool um, idea of I'm using a, a set of tools. In fact, I'm being a bit more specific here and saying I want to use GPT-4. Uh, and the tool is get the name from an email address. So my aim here is to say, write an email to johnm at wolfram.co.uk for not attending an event. But we want to write that email so it looks nicer to the reader. And so we've got a tool that says, if you need to look up the name of a real person, here's how you do it. And then um, what my tool does behind the scenes is use Wolfram language as a bridge to SQL. And I'm just doing a select statement um, uh, from a database that's on the, the target machine. And you can see here that it does its, uh, its job. Probably I need to give it more prompting to say who it should be writing from. But it's written this template that says, um, uh, dear John McLoon, and it's got my name here out of the database. So that was never provided in the prompt. It's come from the tool. Let's do one more, which is essentially the same thing again. Another example, just a different context. Um, I'm making a, uh, a little Q&A thing that understands postcodes. So I, my tool here is, is called GPT-4 with a postcode, sorry, a postcode lookup tool. Uh, that says find facts about a postcode and it needs a postcode which has to be a string and then it's going to call a resource function i wrote some time ago that behind the scenes calls a um uh, uh the uk postcode lookup api so there's a chain of events going on here that when i say what's the constituency of this is the wolfram research europe offices postcode where i'm sat right now um uh, that it calls the llm figures out that it needs a tool the LLM's innate knowledge recognizes what a postcode looks like. So it recognizes this string is probably the postcode. So it knows what postcodes in different countries look like and passes that to my tool. The tool uses uh, downloads the function that I added to our function repository to bridge the gap to the API. It calls the API, which I don't even know who owns the API, the UK post office or somebody like that, that looks up the, um, the response, gives back, in fact, a whole bunch of information like the geolocation and... Um, and uh, and uh, the parish and uh, the street address and things like that. Uh, and then it's used that to pick out only the bit of the information that the question demanded. What's the constituency? And that's um, one of the things you get back is which, uh, which government uh, voting constituency are we in? And we're in uh, the Whitney region. And I've asked various other questions of our postcode, what parish it is, which is basically uh, the, the village, uh, basically the a parish is the area around the nearest church. So this is the village that our offices are in. And then I've asked for the coordinates and it's got back uh, uh, geolocation, which is translated into English from our, from our kind of usual geo markup. 
but in the end, this is all, these are all doing the same thing. Tools can, you can have multiple tools that the LLM can switch to program and you can expose those programmatically so that you can put whatever um, interface or weave them into other code uh, and make these LLM capabilities available with the LLM in charge or with code in charge. Now, I said at the near the beginning that I thought one of the um, the amazing and underappreciated aspects was handling unstructured data. And that, I think, is you know, most of what I've been doing up to now has been either telling stories, doing text synthesis, where it's trying to write content, or it's been chat type things. So they've all been kind of human language um, interactions in one form or another, either on the input or the output or both. When we get into um, into more data science, one of the challenges with data science has always been that data is always in a mess, that you wish it was nice and clean, but either the ontology is messy or it's written in uh, in free form notes or you know all of these things that need cleaning up. And LLM purely as a computational infrastructure helps to deal with that. So here's um, a kind of simple example of how to do that. I've got a new paradigm that I'm using, which is um, in this case, LLM example function. The idea of that is we're going to write a function that is powered by the LLM, but the way we're going to describe it is not using English instructions, uh, but I'm going to give it examples of what it will see. Uh, and as you can mix both. So I can do what I did before of giving instructions, saying write a story like this, um, uh, or I can give examples, or I can do both and say I want you to extract the uh, age and height and name of, the, of a person from the text. And here's some examples of what that should look like. In this case, it works well enough. I've just done the examples. So here's something you might see. Uh, John is a 52-year-old male who is six foot tall. And what I want you to do with that is to make a, wolf, a list with a wolf language association with key value pairs. Name goes to John, age goes to uh, 52. And I want that 52 to be wrapped in quantity comma years. So this is the wolf language syntax for, for units. And the height is going to also be wrapped in units. So again, an example of how to mark that up. I've now given it a little bit more, partly to reinforce the example and partly to show it what to do in other situations. So here I've got an example where uh, the age of this person isn't mentioned. So I'm showing it in this case, I want you to use age goes to missing. And here I've got a third example, which has two people in the same sentence. So I say, well, what I want to do is in this case, see two associations, each of which have a name. So group the information together, name, Mike, age, 25, name Sue, age 23. And in this case, both of them are missing on the height. And from those three examples, it's enough now to be able to give it unseen data. So here is my slightly convoluted story that uh, talks about several people and uh, how they're related and, uh, and has that information embedded. And I've used this function I've just created through three examples to generate a computable data set all of the extraneous information stripped away, the facts brought out, and they're in a computable format. So I can do immediately do things like, what's the shortest person mentioned, and convert their height into miles. And because everything's marked up correctly uh, with missings and uh, and quantities, that just works seamlessly without uh, the missing messing up or the fact that actually these are in the same units, but they could easily have been in different units um, getting in the way. So this is a, as a way of handling unstructured um, freeform notes kind of information is incredibly powerful. You can now take that, all that knowledge that's locked up in, in essays and pull out these salient bits ready to do traditional computation and traditional data science on it. Now, that paradigm of instructions and examples is, is really very rich. Um, so, you know, there I'm saying identify bits of information, pull them out. That's a pure kind of data extraction exercise. But you can use exactly the same paradigm to do all kinds of human-like uh, processing jobs. So um, let's let's show both of these. So this was a um, uh, a proof of concept uh, mini example I wrote uh, um, working with uh, a group called Euphonia, who do uh, speech recognition for medical chatbots. And their problem was that the off-the-shelf speech recognizers are generic. They don't, they aren't trained on medical conversations. They're trained on, on conversations. And so more obscure medical terms tend to get mistranscribed. And so they gave me this example. And you can see what I'm doing here. It's exactly the same as before. I'm mixing some prompt engineering to describe what I want the thing to do. 
that I wanted to correct transcription errors. And then my, I've got two examples, one that's in the topic of hearts, you have a taste maker. And I'm telling it that actually that should have been transcribed as you have a pacemaker. Um, uh, and another topic of hearts, and in this case, I've got Asian populations might have been atrial fibrillation. And I think it's kind of amazing that from just two examples and a bit of description, already the LLM sort of says, oh, yeah, I get it. I know what you're on about here. And now when I give it topic of eyes, I have cats and a glad aroma. It's figured out how to map that to something more uh, eye related. And it's mapped it to I have cats and a uh, so I have cataracts and glaucoma just from those two examples. And of course, if you're doing this um, um, properly, you might um, give it 10, 20 examples, maybe 50 examples to really kind of fill out its space and, and give the training. But just two is enough to achieve this. Um, another kind of error detection, um, uh, again, a mix of prompt engineering examples. Um, this is a typical kind of just a fact checking exercise. I've got some data here that's going to mention um, uh, some diagnoses and drugs, and we just want to pick out, do any of these look inappropriate? Check whether the drugs mentioned are incorrect for the described symptom, return the drug mentioned, and whether it's right or wrong. And I've given it some examples. The patient had a headache, so I prescribed aspirin. I want to say uh, the drug is aspirin, and that was correct. He's taking war warfarin for his blurred vision. I want it to say warfarin is the drug, and that's the wrong thing, because warfarin is a blood thinner. Um, it's used to avoid um, blood clotting. It's nothing to do with uh, vision. And again, from that example, uh, it's enough uh, already to infer what to do with this. The patient uh, had a broken leg and I gave him some loperamide. It says the drug is loperamide, but it's the wrong drug. And here's an example. It's using it correctly. The patient was in need of an upset with a, uh, an upset stomach. I gave them loperamide to help. And that actually is the correct use of loperamide. So that kind of anomaly detection, error detection, um, you know, again, you can imagine, I mean, even, you know, there's a, innate knowledge required here that this is using all of that training in the names of drugs. So even, well, the first one you can imagine, uh, or the, the data extraction, you can imagine taking some 16-year-old uh, intern and saying, here's what I want you to do, and they'd probably do a good job. Here, you kind of need somebody who's got some basic medical training and tell them what to do. And the LLM seems to come with enough basic knowledge to be able to achieve it. Um, how are we doing on time? Let's uh, show a couple of these. Um, so categorization is another thing that uh, that you can do with this kind of methodology in a data science world. Um, I've had these kind of problems in the past where you have two databases and they have different ontologies. One, I seem to have lots of medical examples here. One is a, a database of drug names that perhaps were prescribed. Another is a database uh, or the reporting that you want is the drug type. And we need to join those up. And in the past, that required building big dictionaries where you had to say, you know, aspirin is an analgesic and warfarin is a blood thinner. Uh, now I can just describe that in words. I'm creating a function whose job is to convert the drug into a purpose of drug, a little bit of prompt engineering to make sure it does the right thing and not write essays for me. And now I can apply that function just within a piece of code. So I've got Wolfram language code that says make a pie chart of the frequencies of the purposes of this database of drugs. And you know, while most of this is Wolfram language code, behind the scenes, the LLM is doing that mapping to say, what kind of a drug is aspirin? It's an analgesic. Warfarin and heparin, they're both anticoagulants. And I've done that data mapping uh, entirely with that uh, one line of English language description. Um, let's do one more. Same kind of thing of categorization. Uh, in this case, I'm um, uh, uh, describing uh, a... Uh, an offensiveness uh, rater for, say, a social network post, and we want to block things that are too offensive and make our social network uh, nicer. And again, it's just an example function. I give it a bunch of examples of different scorings according to my personal opinion. So you're a nice person is zero offensiveness up to my worst one on my list is I know where you live and I'm coming to kill you. That's 10 out of 10 offensiveness. And now I can give it these unseen phrases and it tries to map what it's learned from this to say, well, that looks like around level six. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, somewhere around the, I, you're being compared to somebody, uh, uh, something offensive. Um, let's not do an example, but I'll talk about quickly here. 
Uh, it does open up a lot of interesting ideas in ed tech as well, because now assessment um, becomes um, possible to parse very complicated things. So what is an omelet? So that's a really open-ended question. Does the person really understand? You can have a multiple choice very easily, but to be able to allow somebody to say, well, it's a food uh, uh, containing eggs or it's a, a meal that's, uh, that's uh, made with eggs or, or a recipe for an omelet would be eggs, salt, cheese, and ham. Those are all possible answers, whereas saying it's a weapon of mass destruction is not a good answer. Being able to handle that fluency of possibilities in a question, give it a right or wrong answer, um, is now made very easy through LLMs. Um, and we have that already hooked up within our question framework. Now, a slightly different angle that um, uh, I've touched on already um, is that if we go turn back to chat again for a moment, uh, Chat is um, you know, mostly thought of as a kind of uh, human to human type exercise. But actually, as you've already seen from our tool, behind the scenes, you can synthesize code. Um, and so you can now use chat as a way of talking to code or talking or asking questions of code. Um, and the, the plugin is one example of that. But we've, um, I'll show you a, an environment that we've built to try and. Uh, uh, to make that uh, useful, I'm going to start here uh, a chat notebook, which is now part of our environment. So this is one application that um, that we've done uh, to make it easier for people to learn Wolf language. But that's just one application here. So here I'm going to say, let's do something here like uh, uh, plot the uh, differences between the first uh, thousand numbers. Right, let's uh, have a go at that. And what our persona does here is its job is to help me to learn Wolf language. So it's going to say, well, you could use the prime function. You could use differences. It's trying to point out the commands that I could use. But it's now synthesizing uh, the Wolf language codes to achieve that. And hopefully in a moment, we'll, um, uh, it's done that. And it's going to make a plot of the result. And we're going to get our answer concluded. So this has taken a two or three lines of Wolf language code, but I've been able to do that entirely in an English language way. And in a chat environment, you want to be able to reuse context. So uh, let's go on and say, um, uh, show the moving average with a window uh, or size of uh, 200. Make it uh, green uh, with grid lines. And it's going to take the context of the, the previous uh, request, modify the code. Um, so I can look at the code, but at the moment, it's just kind of quietly keeping that to itself. Um, we're just going to kind of continue to modify this thing until um, uh, we get what we want. And um, hopefully, we'll get an answer here. And while it's thinking, I'll just queue up the next question, which is show me the code. So once we've got it into a state that we want, Uh, then hopefully in a moment we will get a picture. Well, it wasn't quite what I wanted. Let's just do one and wasting time here, but let's say show uh, only the moving bridge. Um, so I can kind of backtrack on what it's done a bit here. And uh, let's get that to show me the code uh, because I'm going to assume here in advance it's going to do the right thing this time. And at some point, I'm going to get um, uh, the code that I wanted entirely through conversation by tweaking it. So I've said, that's not quite right. I want this. I want that. And eventually, I've now got the thing that I was aiming for here, which is a nice uh, moving average of the differences of the primes. And we can see that kind of, I think it's, uh, it, uh, it's I can't remember if it scales as square root or log. Maybe I could ask it to fit a line to that. But here's the code that I uh, needed to generate that. And um, and it's deciding to explain that code to me. I don't really care. I will click on copy down. And now I've taken the code out and I've been able to use it. Now, the personas uh, that built is built in here is one choice. Uh, we have a couple of uh, built in of uh, a code writer, which is, which is a more expert level code assistant that goes straight to the code uh, and, and doesn't bother with all this explanation, something that perhaps I would use uh, as I'm kind of familiar with Wolf language, I don't need the explanation, but I, I am lazy in what like code written for me if I can manage it. 
um, plain chat, which has kind of no persona. Uh, but where this gets interesting is to be able to create conversational interfaces to your own code, to your own endpoints, to your own um, to combinations of the two, uh, with goals that are embedded into the notebook, and um, uh, and have access to private information. And we have a mechanism to wrap all of that up in a persona as a demo for this um, um, uh, session. I've created this custom persona called Notebook Reader. So this isn't one that ships with the product. product. I should probably improve it because it's a bit basic at the moment. But I'm going to open uh, a notebook that's already set up to use that persona. And I've got my prompt already in here, which is read injecting reliability.nb, which is the talk notebook that I've been using through this talk and summarize it in 30 words. So in this, I've told it that its job is now to help me to read documents. It's not going to write code. This one is particularly about helping me to interact with notebooks. And I've given it a special tool that can go and uh, find that file uh, within uh, the working directory, read it, convert it into plain text. And then uh, in this case, it's given me the summary. And now I can uh, interrogate that and uh, further by saying, uh, I don't know, make a uh, table of Oh, anyway, let's do something like how many slides are there? Um, slideshow notebook. So there were 12 slides in the notebook. Um, uh, what else? What are their titles? And here's the, uh, the, the main titles that I had on each of the slides of this document. And hopefully the one we're on will come up at some point. Um, uh, there it is, conversation, conversation, the slide that I'm on now. Uh, I could other, ask other things like extract facts from it. I could say something like, who is the author? And uh, because I had um, that in one of the cells, it's been able to read that piece of information and, and pull it out. So this kind of ability to kind of quickly extract information from collections of documents, that's just another kind of persona. So if you start using your imagination and this sort of combination of private knowledge, private databases, um, the prompt engineering to describe what you want, the interactivity of being able to have a session that understands the context of, of what you've said before. Um, you know, I, you'll notice here that it once it's read the document, it doesn't have to keep rereading it to answer this. I've told it already that unless I ask for a different document, that it just should use the information that it extracted the first time for efficiency. You know, all of that knowledge can be wrapped up into a some kind of conversational environment. Um, and in our world as well, these personas can be switched. So I can uh, change this. Uh, I could switch immediately into, for example, a code writing assistant if this was relevant here and say, um, um, uh, I don't know, I haven't tried this. Do I dare do a, a code assistant here? Um, uh, I'm going to try something here uh, that is make uh, a grid of the uh, slide titles. Probably should have rehearsed this beforehand, but uh, here we're using it switched into the Wolf language evaluator because I changed persona here to being the Wolf himself. Hopefully, it's going to pick up the context of taking this information and synthesize some kind of um, import statement. Or I mean, let's have a look and see. Uh, I have to let it finish. Um, we'll see what it's done. Uh, well, it's done something interesting. It's decided to pad it into we're using. Uh, a text padding, and I think I'd want to give it a follow-up prompt, say, no, I want to use uh, um, convert it into a list of lists and use a proper grid function. But uh, let's see what it actually synthesized here. Um, OK, this is kind of interesting. What's it actually done here? It's taken the, it's broken the thing into a list of strings, and it's partitioned them into threes with, uh, in steps of three, Well, it's done some weird partitioning and then put those into a grid. It's done something interesting. It's not quite right. Well, no, actually, no, it, I, I'm going to take that back. That the actual output that it had here before it tries to turn it into a text summary of the output uh, was, in fact, the right thing. And if I copy that down, uh, we can get the actual grid out. So, um, you know, uh, taking live risks seems to have paid off on this occasion. So, um, I think I'm at the end of the hour that I plan to speak at you before I go over to the, uh, the Q&A session. So now's a great time to ask questions as I just uh, wrap up. And I will try and take as many of the questions as I can before we run out of our allocated time. Uh, as you can see, what we're trying to do uh, uh, is bring together 
the LLM uh, kind of modern generative AI world together with the computational world in every different permutation of interface driven, code driven, LLM driven, uh, um, using the LLM to drive code, using code to drive the LLM, making that available uh, as uh, as output reports or in chat environments or as APIs and programmatic delivery and just find all of the important ways and abstract their joining up. The slightly less complicated way of putting it is to fall back on the kind of old metaphor of the human brain that uh, the left brain is uh, creative and the right brain is is logical and you know, in this world, the Wolfram world is the slightly aspergic uh, logical right brain, and GPT is the uh, charming, poetic, creative left brain. And like any good rounded human being, we have uh, some mixture of both and uh, calling on both to solve our, our problems. And that's really the, the aim that we want to have. So thank you everyone for, for patiently listening to that, who's still here.